When I did the introduction, um, it, DCLG in particular, uh, slightly less DWP as the managing authorities, are obsessed with procurement. Uh, and uh, I will, at the end of this presentation, just give you a couple of slides just to illustrate why they are obsessed with procurement. But basically, it's, as I said, it's because it's the highest percentage of errors in the delivery of structural investment funds is from procurement-related errors. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, a, a number of different things. I'm going to just first of all give you a bit of background to pro uh, public procurement rules, you know, where they come from. So don't worry, I'm not going to go through the EU procurement directive paragraph by paragraph because I'm guaranteed to send you to sleep uh, without any doubt whatsoever. Um, there is some really useful guidance in existence. Uh, if you'd have said to me in 2000-2006 uh, programme period, are there any procurement rules for structural funds? I would have said no, of course not. There's public procurement rules that apply to all public expenditure. Well, actually, they did, uh, in the 713 programme and for this programme, produce a set of ESIF procurement rules, well, the guidance, really, but you can treat them as rules, uh, really to avoid any confusion as to what you need to do in terms of adhering to procurement uh, rules, either at EU level or at national uh, member state level, it, because public money is obviously involved given that it's uh, European Structural Investment Fund. So, and the guidance, I think we're on version 5 now of the guidance. Uh, it, I think it's pretty good actually. It's, it's quite nicely laid out and it should tell you what you need to know, so I highly recommend it. We're going to look at the treaty principles of procurement. If you follow the four treaty principles, and um, uh, you will not go too far wrong. They're just basic principles as to uh, how you, uh, you run a procurement uh, process. We're going to look at the thresholds, obviously, to which rules apply, because there is a question of proportionality here. If you're going out and buying one of these, as you did the other day, <laughs> uh, to help you change slides without pressing the button on the laptop, clearly that's not the same as uh, entering into a... Uh, uh, a £50 million construction contract, so there's a level of proportionality to be applied within the rules. And actually, funny enough, it's low-level procurements that obviously cause, uh, quite often cause the, uh, the most uh, problems in my experience, because people just assume they can go out and you know, purchase things without going through any kind of process. Well, perhaps they can, we'll, we'll come back to that later. Single tender actions. I'm, I'm going to answer a question before you ask it. A lot of people say, oh, we can't be bothered with all this, can't we just go and buy what it is we want from whoever we know actually sells it? and have sold it to us loads of times before, and we know it's good and we just want to buy one, and we don't have to bother with all this nonsense. Well, there are some exceptional circumstances where you can do what's called a single tender action, but they are exceptional, and generally speaking, if you do that, you're going to uh, end up in contravention of the rules. So in the kind of theme of how-to, as we try to have a bit of a how-to theme to these workshops, I'm going to run through an actual procurement process. So I'm going to do it on the basis of a kind of medium level procurement. I'm going to run through the six stages of a procurement. So apologies if that's a bit patronising to those of you that are familiar with procurement procedures, but it, might, it helps me highlight a number of issues that you might need to think about uh, as you are undertaking a procurement uh, exercise. And then I'm going to finish off by putting the frighteners on you a little bit by just talking about the error rates in structural, and, uh, structural investment funds and highlight why they are such a big issue uh, and why you will find the obsession with procurement process in uh, dealing with uh, structural funds projects. So in February 2014, the uh, European Council and the Parliament approved two new procurement directives. Uh, we're only really interested for the purposes of this seminar in the first one, which is the EU Public Procurement Directive 2014-24. That is the EU procurement law. Uh, However, it required all member states to transpose the procurement directive into national member state law, uh, which is kind of helpful, I suppose, isn't it? With Brexit and the Great Repeal Bill and bills being transferred into English law, it's already been done for this. Except they'll have to delete reference to the EU and stuff, won't they? But setting that aside, you'll find something called the UK Public Contracts Regulations 2015. If you compare that with that, you'll find it is identical because it is a transposition of the EU Procurement Directive into, into UK law. So really what we're interested in is the UK Public Contracts Regulations, which are, the, as I say, the, the transposing of the directive into UK law. Now, when they were doing these uh, changes, uh, they had all these wonderful ambitions. I'll leave you to decide whether or not they've been satisfied or not. They wanted simplification. <laughs> Do I hear any laughter? Um, flexibility 
a, a focus on greater inclusion, so environmental protection, social responsibility and innovation. There are some flexibilities actually. There's this thing called innovation partnerships for R&D and subsequent pur purchases. This actually relates to, if I've got the right one, yes, this relates to, uh, I mean, for ex probably best if I give you an example. A um, project I've been working on involves some new medical related processes to support businesses. These processes don't actually exist at the moment, so you can't just go and buy them. But the organisation, which is a research organisation, wants to work with potential contractors to develop the processes. So you can't just go out and procure them because they don't, no, one, no one actually does it at the moment. So they want to have an innovation partnership with their contractor to develop the processes. And actually these new procurement regulations allow you to do this sort of thing. The other thing you can do, and we thought about using this recently in another project, is a preliminary market consultation. <coughs> if you want to purchase something, a service, and you don't really know, to be honest, how it's going to be delivered, or sometimes you don't actually you think, well, I don't really know what budget to put for this because we don't know how much it's going to cost. Who's going to do this piece of work and what kind of price will they want? So if you don't, if you don't know that information, you can actually do a pre-market consultation where you put out, effectively you put out a sort of very vague tender and invite people to come back. It's not a procurement exercise, it's a pre-procurement exercise. And then you can have a discussion, test the market, you can have organisations coming forward with suggestions and they, they can even give you a sort of estimated price. Now this is good for companies, isn't it? Because they can really say how they want to do it and give you what they think is a reasonable price. Hopefully you'll get more than one. Uh, and then you are in a much better position to write your specification, set your budget and move ahead with the proper procurement process. Again, these regulations allow you to do that. So they're things that, particularly on larger procurements, they're things that you may want to do. I've already mentioned the guidance. Here it is. We're on version five already. Um, first mention here of the treaty principles. The first thing I need to mention is this uh, question. There's a big question that you get asked at the beginning of any procurement process, and that is, are you, is your organisation a contracting authority? Uh, now, if you are a public sector organisation or an organisation delivering something that's required by the public sector, usually because of some statutory provision, then the answer is probably going to be yes, you are a public contracting authority. If those things do not apply, the chances are you're probably not a contracting authority. Now, uh, when you look in the guidance, you will see that there are different sets of rules for contracting authorities and non-contracting authorities. However, the, the general principles apply equally to both. Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to take a bit of a flyer here because I'm going to, I'm going to sort of generalise about these principles and this process rather than go through the public sector rules and then the uh, non-public sector rules, contracting authority or not contracting authority, I should say, rules, because that will just take too long and uh, be a bit confusing. So this is my first mention of the treaty principles. Here you'll see four of them. Equal treatment, non-discrimination, transparency, mutual recognition and proportionality. They are the principles defined in the procurement regulation. If you stick to all of those, then you won't go too far wrong. And I'll come back to those in a minute and explain uh, what they mean. But let's have a look at the thresholds first of all. Here are the thresholds for uh, public procurement, so for contracting authorities, fairly obviously from the slide. And you'll see here that there are two categories. There are central government authorities and sub-central uh, contracting authority. So a sub-central contracting authority would be, for example, a local authority. It obviously isn't a national public authority. Uh, central government authority is self-explanatory. And you'll see, I don't know if you can see this on the screen or on your slides, but you'll see I've highlighted some here. These are the ones that we most commonly find in structural fund projects. So for uh, works contracts, 5.225 million euros. And you'll see it's the same for both categories. For service type contracts, subsidised services it's called there, and other service contracts, €209,000. So these almost always, in my experience, those are the thresholds that apply to public procurements for structural fund related projects. I mean, of course there are others, so you need to make sure you look at the, uh, the list. Um, in terms of low level procurement, this is where there's a difference between uh, public co contracting authorities and non-contracting authorities. So I'm going to show you the public ones here, and I'll just highlight at the top here uh, a quotation here from something called the interpretive communication. Now the interpretive communication really sets out the principles behind procurement. So you'll see here 
uh, that procurements need to meet the scope of the interpretive communication. So a degree of advertising sufficient to enable the market to be opened up to competition and the impartiality of procedures to be reviewed. So that applies to all procurement with public funding, including structural funds. So if you are a, not a contracting authority, you will see that the threshold is actually naught to 24,999. There isn't this smaller threshold in there. Uh, however, uh, I would strongly suggest, and, and actually says, sorry, it also says that you can do a direct award up to that level. However, you have to ask yourself, does that actually meet the, the interpretation of the, of, the, uh, of the directive here, the interpretive communication? Um, and in my experience, you'll quite often get asked, if you've done a procurement, you'll quite often get asked if you've at least assessed best value. So even if you're buying some sandwiches for the event, did you do this? I don't know. Uh, you can, for example, you don't have to go out and get three quotes, but you might go on three different catering company websites and see what prices they have and just keep it. Just keep. Then you've done best value, haven't you? You've assessed best value for the catering. Uh, so even though you don't have to do that because it only costs £500, uh, I would still recommend that you do it because it, uh, the verification officer or the auditor will probably still ask how you've met the requirements of the interpretive communication. So you'll see here on the actual thresholds for public contracting authorities that if it's less than 2,499, you can do a direct award. So there's no advertising is required. If it's between 2,500 and 24,900, you are required to seek, or should be sought, I should say, from relevant suppliers, uh, three quotes. Uh, you do not have to, you'll notice it says sought, not received. Now, of course, you can ask for 20 quotes and only get one because I, I quite often get asked to quote for work, and I think, oh, I'm not going to bother quoting for that, because I, either I don't want to do it, or I know that there's loads of competition for that particular type of work. It's not my speciality. I'd just be wasting all day filling in a form and not going to get anywhere. In some cases, I've just been asked to quote to make up the numbers, because somebody's trying to meet these rules. <laughs> but if you're a consultant, you don't really want to spend your time writing pointless quotes. Um, so, but what I would say is that if you are going out to the market and you're supposed to seek three quotes, I would actually do more than three requests. So at least double it. It's just, this is just my personal advice. Take it or leave it as you so wish. Uh, because if you have written to three organisations and you only get one quote, it might mean that the verification or audit officer will say, well, these other people you wrote to, are they really the most relevant suppliers for this work? They can question your process, can't they? Whereas if you've written to six or eight, you know, you've made a pretty good effort, haven't you, to get three quotes. If you only get one quote, well, at least you've made the effort and you're within the rules. You'll find it easier to satisfy them if you've done that. That's, that's just my personal advice. So above 25,000, we're international rules. So a formal tender process in line with the interpretive communication and in line with the guidance. And that's what we're going to go through when I go through the six stages of procurement. Now let's get to, oh, and here's my little dog here, transparency. Very important. <laughs> Absolutely must be a transparent process. That means all of the documentation, the specification, etc., must be made available to those that you're inviting to bid. Or if you're advertising, it must be available to those. And we'll come back to that to later on. Let's just get out of the way uh, single tender uh, action and justification. Uh, there are three possible scenarios when you can uh, forget about that process and just do a single tender. Uh, there is a form, you'll see it reproduced on the screen here, it's at the back of the procurement guidance. If you want to do one, you must get prior authority from DCLG or DWP. And I got a bit of a laugh when I said this last time, but you, you can't read it on here, I know. But you'll see here there is a disclaimer on the form. So DCLG or DWP will say, we might give you permission to do this, but we're not taking any responsibility if it goes wrong. And the auditors say it shouldn't have been allowed. There's a disclaimer, it's still, still your problem, even if they've given you permission. Uh, which is not really a very good deal, is it? Uh, but anyway, so extreme urgency. So if there's a storm and the windows blow out in this building, you don't really want to go around getting three quotes, do you? And wait, and then doing a panel assessment, and then you know, three months later, awarding a contract to someone to come and repair the windows. That would be ridiculous. So there's an ex there's an emergency that needs to be done that's unforeseen. If there's only one supplier, but trying to prove there's only one supplier across the EU is a bit of a tough ask. So probably best avoided. Uh, you really don't know if there's one supplier or not, unless it's really specialist. 
No organisations have responded to the advertisement, in which case I don't know where you're going to get your one supplier from anyway, if nobody's responded, because presumably you will have written to the organisation you thought might actually provide the service. So those are the only three reasons that allow you to do a single tender action. So pretty much forget about it. It's going to be very tough to get that agreed. Let's have a look at the treaty principles then. Um, So first of all, proportionality. Uh, must be proportionate. It means proportionate, obviously, to the cost of the procurement, and there are some thresholds and rules that set out the process depending on the amount. So if you're purchasing a few biros, it's not the same as you know purchasing the contractor that's going to build a motorway, and it's obviously there's proportionality to be applied. So it's the correct level of proportionality that's the difficulty, isn't it, given the size of the procurement? And normally, as I say, in my experience, it's more at the lower level uh, where the proportionality issue is less clear. Um, Transparency, we'll come back to this later. Procedures must be transparent and contract opportunities should be properly publicised and advertised, depending obviously on the size of the procurement where you might need to advertise that. Um, you can't just stick an advert on, the, on a new page at the back of your website where nobody's ever looked for contracts before. You need to think about how you can advertise it wider. If it's below certain thresholds, you might write out to appropriate providers. If it's... Um, if it's a big public contract and you're a public contracting authority, then you would always use Contracts Finder to advertise those contracts because people know where to look, don't they? If you're looking for a public contract, then you're going to look on Contracts Finder and search it. You know that all local authorities, government departments, other public authorities use Contract Finder. And I've forgotten the name of it. There's another website, isn't it? If you're not a contracting authority, there's another website that you can use to advertise your, your uh, contract more widely. It's got completely out of my head. Help. You've forgotten as well? Yeah. Okay. We'll try and remember that later on or send something around. Not tenders electronic donors. It's not tenders electronic donors. Tenders electronic daily. Mm, doesn't sound right. Mm. We'll, we'll come back to that one when we remember it. Sorry about that. I should put it on the slide and I won't forget, will I? Mutual recognition simply means that you recognise standards and qualifications from other EU member states with equal validity. So a degree from the university in Belgium is worth the same as a degree in the university from England or whatever, or different types of standard or qualifications. There's a lot of commonality across the EU anyway, so it's not usually a problem. And finally, equal treatment and non-discrimination. Fairly obviously, you must treat all potential providers equally and not have any form of discrimination within your process as a fairly obvious rule. Stages of procurement then, so I'm going to run through this pretty quickly but I hope it will be useful. There are basically six stages as defined, this is in the use of guidance as well by the way, six stages of procurement, so obviously preparation and planning, the invitation to bid process, so where are you going to advertise the opportunity or, or make it available to potential suppliers, the submission and selection of bids, so the selection criteria, the evaluation of the bids, so the award criteria, And I'll come back and explain the difference between selection and award later on because it's really important to get that right. Uh, And obviously the contracting process and the implementation of the uh, contract, the basic stages. So let's start with uh, preparation and planning. Um, You will be required to produce a procurement plan if you're going to do some procurement and you've mentioned it in your full application. You'll find there's an appendix required which is a procurement plan. It doesn't tell you Uh, what you should actually put in it, by the way, but uh, what you should put in it is pretty pretty much the stages I listed on the previous slide, who's going to do what and by when and what systems you will use to to go through that process. Uh, So a procurement plan. You will need to decide on the procurement route, depending on whether you're a contracting authority or not. You will need to choose the process. I'll, I'll come on to the six different processes you can use in a minute. Apply the thresholds, obviously. Scope the specification, so scope out what exactly it is that you require. Um, now here there's a, uh, you know, a little bit of flexibility, I suppose. You don't want to be too vague. Um, there is a clarification process. If you're too vague, you'll get lots of questions from people saying, well, I'm not really sure what you want. Can you clarify? Uh, on the other hand, maybe you don't want to be too prescriptive either. You might want organi- organisations to come forward with some ideas about how best this, this particular thing can be delivered or what type of product might make, meet your needs. So, you know, it's a, it's a balancing act, isn't it, to get it right in between. Uh, so scoping specification, uh, choosing the criteria, 
identifying any conflicts of interest. Just to give you an example here, I worked with a large county council on a project a couple of years ago in this programme, um, and they wanted, they had an inward investment service within the council. They wanted to uh, expand, it was very small, they wanted to expand it significantly with the RDF. Also, they wanted at the same time to contract it out. And the people working on the inward investment service uh, were going to form a consortium to bid to do it as well, like an in-house bid. Well, they're going to set up their own organisation to bid for it. Now, who's best placed to write the specification? Well, obviously the people that are working on the Inward Investment Service. Who can't write the specification because of a conflict of interest? The people working on the service because they're going to make a bid. You can't write the specification and then bid for it yourself. Pretty obvious reasons. So we have a bit of a dilemma. In fact, we had a lot of correspondence with DCLG on that. They wanted a letter from the council's lawyers to explain how they'd absolutely ensured a separation between the functions or even you know even going up to the level of the directorate you know um, head of head of service at the directorate in the local authority um, they went to the nth degree to try and prove that that was the case and it, and it was fine in the end but you know there was a potential conflict of interest that DCLG were really worried about in the project and you know I, c- I can s- I can see why the time scales for procurement and for delivery Arrangements for a clear audit trail to make sure you get all the documents retained. The type of contract envisaged. So is it going to be for performance related? Are you going to pay the contractor once a quarter? Are you going to pay them for reaching certain milestones or delivering certain targets? A lot of ESF contracts are tend to be performance related. You know, how many people have gone into work in sustainable job outcomes? How many people have moved on to other training or, or whatever? They tend to be performance related contracts. If you, just pay, if you just pay the contractor once a quarter for doing what they do but not delivering targets, then you know, maybe you've not got an incentive in there for them to deliver the contract. So the type of contract that might be uh, awarded. I think I've got Yes, I have on, a, on another slide here. So uh, are you going to have one of these six different procedures? Which one are you going to use? So the open procedure, the restricted procedure, competitive procedure with negotiation, competitive dialogue, innovation partnership, negotiated procedure without prior publication. I'll come back to these one in turn in, in turn uh, in a few minutes, if I may. Also consider what type of contract you're going to award. So you might want a framework agreement. Somebody mentioned a framework agreement just a minute ago. Framework agreement is where, instead of just hiring one organisation, you might hire a, a number of different organisations because you want to... I mean, if, let me give you an example. It's probably best to explain it. At the development agency, we, we outsource some of our project appraisal for the ERDF, actually to certain expert organisations. We had a framework agreement, procurement, so we got about six or seven consultancies on the agreement. When we had a project appraisal, we would write out to them, ask them all to do a little mini competition, show their expertise. We didn't have to do a full procurement every time. We had them as part of a framework agreement so we could use those consultancies to deliver work over a longer period. So it may be that that's what you're looking for. The other one is the dynamic purchasing system. So you would often use this for where you do regular purchases. So, you know, your stationary contract is likely to be a dynamic purchasing system, isn't it? You don't want to do a procurement exercise every time you need some photocopier paper. That would be ridiculous. Uh, So you'll probably have a contract, uh, a dynamic purchasing contract. You will have gone out to suppliers, got a bid, uh, got that there. But you could keep reordering things from the same provider under a dynamic purchasing uh, system agreement. So you will have set that out in your process at the outset. Now I'm going to go through the six types of procedure. The one that you're going to use most often, I suspect, is this one, the open procedure. 51% apparently uh, are under this procedure. So you're just going to go out to tender and then you're going to receive bids and go through a process of awarding them, fairly obviously. The second one is the restricted procedure. This is where you do a pre-qualification questionnaire. So you will go out to contract... Interested suppliers are first asked to provide their qualifications, then you drop a shortlist, then you invite the full bids from the shortlist. You've probably heard of the pre-qualification questionnaire process. A competitive dialogue might be for where you're using, having a more complex procurement. So a dialogue between the contracting authority and potential suppliers with the aim of identifying and defining the best legal or financial setup to satisfy the needs or objectives. Quite commonly used for ESF type contracts. Uh, as is the next one as well, uh, competitive procedure with negotiation. In fact, uh, one of the senior contract people at DWP was telling me that they're very much moving towards this sort of process because uh, they're looking for uh, 
inviting chosen operators to submit an initial tender, then negotiating the initial and subsequent tenders submitted apart from the final tender, which can't be... So in other words, there's a process of negotiation with potential suppliers within this defined contracting process that allows them to arrive at a final contract. Um, so it so gives them a bit more say over how it's delivered. Negotiated procedure without publication is very, very unusual. Um, predetermined number of cases, so you probably won't need to do that. The innovation partnership is the one I already mentioned, where you don't know what it is you're going to buy. It doesn't exist, but you want to work with organisations to develop that process or product. Uh, so these are, these are actually uh, uh, available now under the new rules. So invitation to bid, you've got to choose the route to advertise. Obviously, if it's above the threshold, it has to go through the official journal of the European Union. Very prescribed process there. It has to be advertised across the EU. Contracts below those thresholds, the national rules apply, but we must follow the treaty principles. You should also leave a little bit of space in here for clarifications. It's very, very useful. <coughs> Nobody ever writes a perfect specification. Uh, it's really useful to have a period of time in your process that allows organisations... This is within the period that it's being advertised organisations can write in and ask a question. Um, even happened with this, I think, didn't it? There were some questions, yeah. So uh, contractors will write in and say, do you mean this or do you mean this? Or can you clarify what you mean by X, Y and Z? Um, now the process means, pretty obviously, to be fair, open and transparent, that every other potential contractor must be able to see the questions and the answers. They must be shared. So you must have some kind of portal, some kind of arrangement. You cannot... You can't answer a phone call from one person asking questions. So if somebody rings up and says, can I ask you this? Well, no, you have to send it in through the official portal so that everybody can see the question and the answer, thereby you're being fair, open and transparent, meeting the treaty principles. Which, of course, you absolutely did in your... <laughs> uh, stage three, so the submission and selection of bids. And I'll come back to selection and award criteria in a minute, if I may. So looking at the bid criteria, you will have set that out and published that. Um, for a medium level procurement. You might have some minimum criteria pass fail. Uh, so for example, uh, contractors are often asked to provide a minimum level of insurance, indemnity insurance in my line of work. Uh, often asked for minimum levels. You have to, it's a yes, no. You either you've got this insurance, you can prove it or you haven't, in which case you're, it's a yes, no, you're ruled out of the procurement process. Uh, some, sometimes a lot of local authorities usually get asked lots of questions about have you been convicted of a crime and all this sort of stuff. And if you have, then you're ruled out of the... If your company's gone bankrupt in the past, you get ruled out of applying for certain things. So all kinds of uh, pass-fail criteria. You must obviously not accept bids after the deadline. So all late bids are automatically rejected. And you must apply the selection criteria. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then stage four is the evaluation. So you're reviewing all of the bids against your award criteria... And uh, you're keeping detailed audit trail and records of all of that, of course, and the evaluation documentation. No negotiations at that stage. I think, uh, sorry, the award stage. So the award stage, if it's OGU, you have to notify through OGU. Um, you have to obviously contact the successful organisation. You may have to have, quite likely will have to have this what's called standstill period to allow for appeals, particularly if it's a larger contract. So you may be able to notify organisations that have won the bid and those that have not been successful and allow an appeals procedure, which is usually on the basis that the process has not been properly followed. They can't just appeal on the basis they don't agree with your decision, only on the basis that the process hasn't been properly followed. And then you're going to implement the contract, exchange contracts. Be very, very careful with modifications. It's so tempting, isn't it? We started this process six months ago. When we've arrived at awarding the contract, actually we've decided they might be useful if they did something slightly different. That can be a very bad mistake because uh, if you've changed the specification that you originally advertised, that's grounds for somebody to object and appeal against the process. Now, I'm going to just uh, give you some examples of selection criteria and award criteria because I think it's really important to understand the two. What about once the work's actually started and you realise something needs to be tweaked and amended and modified? Difficult. Mm. Difficult because... It depends on, the, on how you've advertised the specification. I mean, for example, um, I did a specification for a local authority which was to do with assessing the need for a financial access to finance product for SMEs. Uh, it was to do with an equity investment fund, but we thought, well, this is going to take quite a long time. And if the equity investment fund isn't going to go ahead, we don't want to have wasted our money. So we included in the contract 
uh, a change clause, but it specified that we would want them to focus on other types of financial instruments and access to finance measures if we decided to change the specification at that stage. So everybody knew that in advance there could be a change. Uh, ran that through the procurement team at the County Council, they said, yeah, that's okay, because you've notified the change. If you change it completely after you've awarded the contract, um, then you can be in, in difficulties. You may have a potential procurement in, uh, rules infringement, which the auditors will pick up. Th not the answer you wanted to hear, I'm afraid, is it? <laughs> It does, it does. So you actually knew it was do the wrong thing? No, it, well, is, is it fair, open and transparent to change the contract for the contractor after you've awarded it? Which may have meant that other people might have bid, may have mean that you, another bid would have been successful, not the one you approved. You can look at it a different way, can't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, no, I can see that. Yeah. Well. Right, selection criteria. Assesses the suitability of bidders, not the bid. Let me be clear about this must be relevant to the contract. So if you ask for qualifications, you can't ask that they've all got PhDs uh, if it isn't necessary that they have PhDs. Um, so you need to they ask for relevant qualifications. You might set minimum criteria, business probity and ethics, technical and professional qualifications and competence, capability and experience. Capacity is one, isn't it? If you're contracting with a very small organisation and you want them to deliver a very big job, have they got the capacity to deliver? You might want to ask about their structure and their capacity. What happens if two of their staff go off sick for a year? Are they going to be able to cover? Uh, it might be a question you want addressed in the, in the bid. That's to do with selection criteria, because you're looking at the bidder and not the bid. Really, really important to understand the difference. Award criteria is doing the other thing. It's assessing the, what's based on the bid, which bidder is best placed to deliver and should be awarded the contract must be clearly defined in the specification. So here you can look at the price, the quality, the methodology that they're going to use to deliver the contract, technical merit, you might look at their approach to sustainability, that quite often comes up in these types of bids. And when you are assessing the award criteria, you know, you have to be, I told you you've got to keep all the documentation. I'll give you my, my story, you've heard this many times before. A large local authority I worked with did a procurement for a big capital project, uh, on the award criteria assessment form, um, they went through the process, they awarded the contract. The auditors came in, the ELDF auditors came in, looked through all the documentation. They found a form which was written, filled in by one of the assessors on the award criteria panel. And he'd written, I know these guys, they're really good. We should give them the job. <laughs> is that an assessment of the award criteria? No, not is it. Found an irregularity. Unfortunately, the contract, it, there, there were two or three bids very, very close. So the auditors were concerned that it might have influenced the result of the panel. It wasn't like one was miles ahead of the others. And you could argue, well, it made no difference, to be honest. Even if we ruled that score out, it wouldn't make any difference. Actually, it did make a difference. So the, con so the upshot of it all was a massive row, lots of legal actions and threats. And we ended up with a financial penalty being imposed fairly not, not too big a financial penalty, but a financial penalty nonetheless for a infringement of the procurement process. Now, what normally happens, in my experience, if you're doing these in a big local authority or something, is that you have a procurement team, and the procurement team will review all these forms. If anyone's written anything daft like that, they'll send it back and say, you can't say that. Please rewrite this. <laughs> it used to happen regularly when I worked in the development agency, I'm afraid. Giving away some secrets here, but he did. Uh, just to make sure that it has to be relevant. You must be assessing against the criteria. No other factors can be taken into account. The selection criteria, you can look at the bidders. The award criteria, you're looking at the bid itself. That's the important distinction between the two. Is to judge them on quality. I mean, what, he's, what he wrote down is a valid statement relating to the quality of the supplier. It's just the way he worded it, presumably. It, it was not, it's not an assessment of the bid, though, is it? The bid would have responded exactly to the specification mm. to build the, the particular building that they were seeking for. Uh, and you would assess the proposal, wouldn't you? But he's interpreting their ability to build that building to the best standard that he needs, which is a quality kind of... He might be, he might be arguably be looking at the selection criteria, the suitability and capacity and experience of the bidder, mm. but he's not, he was assessing against the award criteria. So it's a technical discrepancy, but it can lead to a financial correction. That's the problem, and did in this case. Yeah, that's how careful you have to be with procurements. Interesting, it wasn't picked up by the first audit. They missed it. So it was only 
DCLG hired some procurement lawyers to do checks on procurement, and it was them that picked it up. The DCLG staff had missed it when they did their verification. So that's why you just have to be so careful with these things. I mean, I, yeah, I, I take your point. I think you, you know, absolutely right. Now, this is an example of a scoring matrix. So you will publish with your documentation how you're going to score and what your assessment criteria is. You don't have to use this one. It's just an example. As you can see, we've gone from unacceptable to excellent, and we've got a narrative there that gives a definition of those scores. You can award anywhere in between. And it's really useful to publish that in your specification, say how you're going to score it, what the different types of scoring will be and against what criteria. Then it's open and transparent in terms of a process and uh, you're less likely to be challenged. I want to just finish off by just highlighting why procurement is such a big issue. Um, I don't know if you can see from this diagram here, but you'll see 47.8% of errors in cohesion policy 2014, these are the Commission's figures, uh, actually the Court of Auditors' figures, uh, were caused by errors in public procurement. Only 21, sorry, 27% ineligible cost. State aid, only 21%. So you can see where the majority of the errors are occurring. So they put, because of these figures, they put pressure on member states to do more and more checks on procurement to try and uh, remedy these issues. In fact, it's such a big issue, the Court of Auditors produced a report specifically on procurement and structural funds in 2015. You can find it if you want to, but you'll see they said here, read it from my own notes, they say here that failure to comply with public procurement rules has been a perennial and significant source of error. Serious errors resulted in lack or complete absence of fair competition and or the award of contracts to those who were not the best bidders. It's a pretty damning report from the European Court of Auditors. They were not happy at all. They've categorised the errors into serious, significant and minor. And unfortunately, the majority of errors fit into serious or significant. I won't read out the definitions there. They're on the screen or in your notes. Worth looking, I think, just looking at where they've identified some errors. So in the pre-tendering process, direct award of contracts, absolute no-no, not allowed. Splitting contracts into smaller Lots, if you like, to avoid the thresholds, completely unacceptable uh, practice. Can't you, you have to be careful with that if you re-procure something, by the way. If you, if you procure something and then you think, well, we've had three years of that, we'd like another three years, same contract gets awarded the contract, S suddenly you can change where you are in the thresholds, can't you? Uh, and they will count that. So that can, be a, that can be a difficulty. Inappropriate tendering procedure used. I went through the different stages, uh, uh, types of procurement earlier on. So 82% of errors in pre-tendering were found to be serious by the Court of Auditors. So in the actual tendering process, problems with the publication and transparency requirement, uh, highest percentage of errors, specification of unlawful and incorrect application of selection and award criteria, which is the example I just gave there, procedural weaknesses including lack of appropriate documentation. And that, this is an important point. Even if your procurement was conducted absolutely perfectly with no errors. If you can't produce the paperwork, it is de facto uh, ineligible and uh, the entire procurement can be ruled ineligible expenditure if you can't find the right paperwork. If you're missing some paperwork, you may have a financial correction. I'll come on to that in a minute. And my favourite one, modifying or extending the scope of contracts without using procurement procedure to pick up a question uh, from over there. Uh, it's really tempting. It happens so many times usually because of the amount of time that's gone by in the process. You know, you arrive at actually awarding the contract, things have changed a bit, the world's moved on, you may want to add some other things to it. Be really, really careful with that. One of the things you can do is write the spec in such a way that it allows you to make modifications. Everyone has seen that, then you've got some scope. One thing you might do, by the way, is allow for extensions. It's quite common. I've got a contract that allows for that. It's just been extended. So, um, and I, I did say to them, are you sure you can do that? And I looked in the paperwork and indeed they had written it into the contract and into the specification. There's an option to extend the contract by another two years. So that's what they've done, and that's, that's, it should be compliant because it's within the original documentation. It's fair, open, and it's transparent. Now, I don't want to frighten you off too much with this, um, but if, uh, you do, uh, if you do contravene these rules, there's what's called a flat rate correction that can be applied. Um, if you... Uh, award obviously a contract completely without sufficient advertising a direct award then obviously uh, potentially up to 100% of that contract can be ineligible expenditure more likely some of these other infringements can result in 
up to 25% uh, flat rate corrections. Because there isn't actually a... <coughs> if, if you put um, £1,000 of ineligible expenditure into a project claim and claimed it and then realised it was ineligible, there's £1,000, isn't there? It's a financial cost to that. With procurement, there isn't a financial cost. So what happens is a flat rate correction is applied. So for certain infringements, certain percentage corrections will apply. It's what's called a flat rate correction. Same thing applies, by the way, to the publicity regulations. If you don't put the logo on your materials, then a flat rate correction can be applied. There's no monetary cost as such, is there? But a flat rate correction is applied. In other words, money is taken from the project as a consequence of those infringements. So there's an enormous list of these. I've only put a few of them up here. If you look in the guidance, you'll find about six pages defining the type of corrections that can be made in the event of a procurement irregularity. Uh, so I hope I haven't frightened you off too much. I've given you a, a review, an overview of public procurement rules. I've talked about the treaty principles, which are really important. If you follow those, you won't go too far wrong, in my view. Basic run-through of the procurement process, the six stages... We've looked at the error rates in procurement, so where you're most likely to have those problems and avoid them. I would, again, just refer you to the ESIF guidance. It is very good. Uh, it does set out contracting authority and non-contracting authority rules and thresholds, and it does give you some insight into procedures. Uh, you will need to produce all sorts of documentation if you're going to do at least any kind of higher-level procurement within a project. You'll need to produce lots of documentation on your systems in advance, because they're going to do upfront compliance checks to make sure that you <coughs> don't fall within those 47% of errors which have been identified through the uh, audit process. Okay, take a deep breath. That was procurement. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, we've passed the non-contracting authority, yep. so the thresholds are different. Now, earlier you said um, yep. about the director award, so yep. the director award, Anything under twenty five thousand yes. we can do as a direct award, in theory. In theory. But you said best practice yes. would be to still evidence Yes. That. So <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so I suppose would we where we are doing direct awards and we're not providing that because the guideline says we don't need to, where would we sit with the managing authority? In terms uh, of you know, well, we're following the guidelines as long as we're yeah, well, the treaty well, it would be very hard for them to apply an irregularity if you followed the rules. Um, however, what they tend to do, in my experience, is they tend to look at the interpretive communication and the treaty principles. Uh, so they might say to, I mean, I, I would suggest, if, if, obviously, if it, you know, if it's a few hundred pounds, then it, you know, it doesn't really matter. But if it, if it is, but even that, I mean, I've known them ask for, uh, literally, I'm not making this up purchase of sandwiches they said well did you get three quotes oh yeah you know, are you serious uh, and but they but they do and they say oh well okay it's not an infringement of the rules but next time we'd be far better if you got three quotes because then you can show best value and that meets the treaty, treaty principles uh, i'm only saying it as i've seen it and i uh, and i think obviously if you're going up to the upper end of that 24 yeah. 25 000, then you know there's lots of reasons why you should do that anyway if you're going to that level because I think you, you, you probably do want to get the best quote, don't you? Yeah. And it is public money and it yeah, does so meet the treaty principles. The yeah, propor proportionality applies yeah. as well. That's another one of the treaty principles, of yeah. course. So if it's £10.50, nobody's seriously expecting you to get three quotes. If it's 24999 then it's just good practice, isn't it, to get three quotes, I would suggest. And it will, it will make the auditors feel much more comfortable that you've done that. Because it meets the interpretive... The interpretive communication is very... In fact, even the ESIF guidance, it doesn't use these words, but it, if you read it, what it actually says is that it's a bit vague, this guidance, but we recommend that you, you, know, you do follow best practice uh, to show best value, rather, in your procurement processes in line with the treaty principles and the interpretive communication. OK, okay. does that help? Yeah. Um, under the ESF simplified option, the 40% one... Does that give you kind of the option to ignore all of this? No. No? Okay. No. Good question. <laughs> that's a very good question, actually. Uh, yeah. No, no, it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's good. yeah, you might think so. That's a pity it doesn't really. That would be even more simplified, <laughs> wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, it doesn't, I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs>